So this week I had, um, I had one of those moments that sometimes married couples have. It's like, especially if you've been married for a while, for a few years, you know, been married for a longer period of time. Maybe you've kind of felt this or experienced this. But I was sitting there and, um, and I was looking at Jen and I just felt this, this awe. And uh, now I don't mean like, you know, middle school girl, like surfacing, like, aw. Okay, I'm not talking about that. I mean like, like a deep sense of man awe. <laughs> um, because I just thought about, I thought about like my life before her. And then I, I thought about my life with her. And I thought about how physically beautiful she is to me. I thought about how stinking hard she works. I thought about how much I admire her as a mother and as a friend and as a leader. And, and I, th- I thought about the reality that we've, we've walked through some incredible highs, but we've also journeyed through some, some really low lows. And I thought about, like, how much I trust her. Like, I don't know if you know this, I really trust her. Uh, I trust her heart. I, I trust that she has my back. Uh, I trust that she makes good decisions. And I had this moment where I was looking at her where I just felt this, this deep awe of my wife. And I was like, it's, it's, it's really, it's unbelievable when I pause long enough to really take it all in and consider it. And I, I was just like, how in the world did I end up with her as my wife? And it was this really powerful moment. But um, here's something unfortunate, and I would say maybe a sign of how flawed I am. I actually don't live most of my life immersed in this feeling of awe for my wife. Like when I stop and really think about it and really let it settle in, it comes sometimes. But I've noticed that like the grind of life, because of just the everyday challenges of life, I don't always feel that. Life happens, right? Like we have stress. We, we have misunderstandings sometimes. And, and maybe, the, I think for us, maybe just the biggest factor in all of this is we just become familiar. Like our days can become kind of predictable and there's just this normalcy and predictability and, and sometimes that awe can go missing. It can go missing for quite some time. And here's what uh, kind of something that I've noticed just about, about being human and the feeling of awe. And it's this. Once something becomes familiar, it can stop producing awe in us. Really. I mean, once it's familiar, it stops producing awe. Familiarity makes it very, very difficult for us to just continue to feel awe. And w- this morning, I want us to think about something extremely beautiful that is central to our faith, uh, something that is so stunning when it's clearly seen that I, I really believe that awe is the only appropriate response. But this is so familiar to us that it, 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 it kind of drops into that category of, of being of the danger of just losing, losing the awe, losing the, the, the strikingness of it. And if you're somebody who's walked with Jesus for a long time, this can be especially true for you. And uh, as I look back over my journey with Jesus, it's certainly been true for me. So I want to remind us of something that is so beautiful. And it's my hope this morning that what we can do together is just pause and recapture the awe that I think is, is, is the natural response to this. And so to get into this, we're going to look at an interesting encounter that Jesus had one day. And we're going to see something in this story that's kind of a theme for Jesus. Um, in the Gospels, in the stories of Jesus, there's, there's something that happens with him a lot. Oftentimes, um, a person will come to him, and they're wanting something very specific from him, right? And often, he ends up kind of weaving around that and addressing something entirely Different. He takes them in a direction that they never expected. And I think that this is because sometimes our, our felt need isn't really our deepest need, right? Sometimes our pressing need isn't really our primary need. And so Jesus has this way of, of jumping straight to the deepest needs, no matter what it is that people are thinking they're coming to him for. 
And so this morning, we're going to see a guy who has a pressing need, this urgent, obvious, deep-felt need, and he comes to Jesus to get that need taken care of. But Jesus does something else, something unexpected. Okay, this is Mark chapter 2. Here we go. It says, A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. So the picture is, is that Jesus is in this house in Capernaum, and the crowds are enormous. The house is completely packed, like body to body to body, and then there's crowds that are, that are surrounding the house. So there's people like trying to peek through the windows or trying to just get a glimpse of Jesus or trying to just hear a little bit of Jesus' teaching. It says, Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. So apparently, like, as Jesus got into town, right, everybody got all fired up, and, and, and pretty much everybody headed out to where Jesus was to, to, to see and hear Jesus. But these four guys, they rushed off to get their paralyzed friend, which is pretty cool. I, I, I don't know about you, I hope I have friends like that. So, and they say, they, they go get their friend, and they're like, hey, buddy, the rabbi that everybody is talking about has come into town, and we think... I know this is crazy, but we think if we could just get you to him, you could be healed. Like, just imagine it. What if you didn't have to lay on this mat every day the rest of your life and beg? How cool would that be? So they're like, come on, buddy, let's, let's go. And so they hoist him up and they, they carry him who knows how far. Well, when they get to the house, it's just completely maddening because they can't get their friend in there. They, they have no way to get to Jesus. The crowds are dense, and there's a lot of sick people there. He's not the only person that needs to be healed, and there's a lot of curious people there. There's a lot of religious leaders there. They can't get their friend anywhere near Jesus, but one of them gets an idea. So they climb up on the roof, a roof made of like branches and, and reeds and dried mud, And they hoist their paralyzed friend up onto the roof, and then they burrow a hole through the roof. And so you you get a picture of what's happening here. Jesus is teaching, right, and everyone's just riveted. People are very quiet. And suddenly they start to hear scratching on the roof, right? And then there's some pounding, and then they hear some voices, and pretty soon Jesus is trying to teach, but there's all this crud from the roof that's fluttering down, right? It's getting in his hair and in his beard and everything, branches and mud, right? And pretty soon everybody's kind of looking up, and all of a sudden sunlight breaks through the ceiling, and Jesus just stops what he's talking about because no one's paying attention anyway, (laughs) right? And everybody's just looking up. And so they see this little hole of light that's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And pretty soon, there are faces peering through the hole, looking down at Jesus. And he's looking up, right? And he's trying to get the debris out of his hair. And then the light in the hole gets clouded for just a second because something is being lowered down through the hole. And pretty soon, everybody in the room starts to realize it's, it's a paralyzed man on a mat. Now imagine you're the paralyzed guy. What is this like for you? Right? If you're laying as a paralyzed man on a mat, which direction are you probably facing? Up. You can't see anything that's going on, right? You're like, guys, what's happening, right? And so he's just getting lowered down. He's getting lowered and lowered and lowered. He can't see anything. All he can, all he can see is the hole in the ceiling and his friend's faces. And so I imagine they're kind of lowering him down with the rope, and he's looking up, and they're all just like, Thumbs up, dude. And so finally he gets low enough where he could see Jesus. And Jesus peers over the edge of the mat and and he smiles at him. And there's a buzz in the crowd. But everybody's trying to hush it. Right? Everybody wants to hear what Jesus is going to do. Everybody wants to be dialed into what Jesus is going to do. Now, everybody knows what this guy is here for. Everybody knows what he's there for. This guy is, is not here for the teaching. Right? This guy didn't come because he really wants to hear 
a sermon. He's here for one reason and one reason only. These four guys have done whatever it takes to get their friend to Jesus. The guy is paralyzed. And Jesus is his one hope to become not paralyzed. So everybody, everybody in the room knows, everybody outside knows what it is that this guy wants, what he needs. So anticipation is growing in the crowd. And so Jesus looks at the man, and then he looks at his friends on the roof, and it says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. <laughs> what? So envision it. Jesus, he's brushing off the debris. The anticipation in the room and out in the courtyards is off the charts. The other sick and the other disabled people are going, all right, here we go. Let's end the sermon and get the healings going. Let's get this, come on, baby. Let's get this thing rolling. This is why we're here. And the four friends, they're up there, like they're high-fiving each other and they're laughing because they know we did it. We figured out a way. We got him to Jesus. Like our job here is done. Like, I don't even, we don't even know how he would get him back up, you know, like, but it doesn't matter because he's going to get healed and he's going to walk out of here. And the paralyzed guy, he's down there, he's like going, he's going, this is it, right? Like, this is the moment that my life changes. Jesus leans over and he bends down to the man and he says, good news. I have seen the faith of your friends. I've seen your faith and your great hope. And so, son, here's the good news. Your sins are forgiven. The guy's like, what? <laughs> right? My sins are forgiven. I, I imagine the paralyzed going, okay, guys, I guess you're going to have to hoist me back up somehow and figure this out because we went to all this trouble to get me here and my sins are forgiven. Yay. Like, this is not exciting. This is, this is kind of disappointing. Everybody's disappointed. And the, the, paral, the paralyzed guy is like, that's it? Like, that's all I get? And so you have to imagine the confusion and the disappointment that his four friends are feeling. They're like, what, sorry, what did he say? Like, Bill, did you hear? What did he say? His sins are forgiven. What do you mean his sins are His sins are forgiven. So they're like, time out, Jesus, up from the roof, like, hold on, time out, stop everything. Uh, just so you know, we didn't bring him here to have his sins forgiven. Um, you may not have realized this, he's paralyzed. <laughs> we went to all this trouble so that you could heal him. Okay, we're here for a miracle. We're here so that our paralyzed friend could become unparalyzed. And while all this is going on, there's a, another group reacting to this. There are all these religious leaders, and they're watching, right, as they always do, and they're evaluating Jesus from the distance. And they're not just disappointed by this. They're shocked. They're offended. It says, now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Okay, so there's these teachers of the law. These guys are, are experts in religious law, and they are highly educated, and they are highly respected. And these are the guys that explain to you how to get your sins forgiven. You, you can't get your sins forgiven in Israel in that time without these guys explaining it to you. And they hear Jesus, who has no formal religious credentials, He's a carpenter, and they hear Jesus tell this guy that his sins are forgiven, and so they're going nuts. They're going, they're going crazy. They're like, whoa, 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 you can't just do that. You can't, you can't pronounce that this man's sins are forgiven. Getting your sins forgiven is complicated, rabbi. Getting your sins forgiven is expensive and time-consuming, and there's a process. First, you have to go and buy a spotless sheep or a, or a goat or a lamb. If you're dirt poor, like maybe you can get a, you can get a pigeon. So you, you have to have an animal like to sacrifice. That's how this works. And you have to make sure you're ceremonially clean so that you can go into the temple. And then when you get in the temple, in order to even get in the temple, you have to stand in this really, 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 really long line. 
And the reason that it's really long is because there's a lot of people that want their sins forgiven and there's only a few guys that have the credentials to be able to do it. So you have to stand in this long line. And when it's finally your turn, the priest takes your lamb or your goat, or if you're one of those poor souls that can only afford a pigeon, and then he slaughters it. And there's blood everywhere. And then the priest says some things, and then the priest can pronounce that your sins are forgiven. But that's only temporary, because after you sin again, you have to get another animal, and you have to do the whole thing all over again. And on top of that, Jesus, all sins are primarily an offense against God. Whether this guy, whether it's this guy's sins, or whatever this guy's sins are, They're not an offense against you, Jesus. They're an offense against God. Therefore, only God has the authority to truly forgive sins. Who do you think you are, Jesus? God? So Jesus senses that all these reactions are going on. And it says immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit what this, uh, what Sorry, I was of a misprint of mine. Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit what, what this was. What, what is NIV doing? So he knew what they were thinking. And he said to them, Wow. Why are you thinking these things? He said, which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? The fact is, guys, I do have the authority to forgive sins. You have no idea. I have authority to do things you can't imagine. But to show you, okay, to demonstrate my authority, to give you a glimpse into who I am, what if I were to do something that only God could do? What if I were to set this man free from his paralysis? Now the crowd, at this point, they're like, okay, here we go. And they're leaning in again. Nobody got too excited about forgiveness. But if Jesus is going to perform a miracle, okay, if Jesus is going to heal, then this is the deal. Like, this is is the show. This This is why we came. Nobody's really there for forgiveness. They got got other issues, right? They got other stuff. And I just want to pause here and say, man, can I relate to that. Man, can I relate to that. To the people in the crowd and this guy's friends and the paralyzed guy, and, and maybe you can too, but like I've got needs. Like I got stuff I want God to do. It's really good stuff. It's really important stuff. It's stuff that God should want to do. And to be honest, forgiveness is pretty low on my list of needs. It's really not the main thing that's on my mind. I mean, with all the pressures of life, I mean, you you feel this, right? With all the pressures of life, I have other more pressing needs. I mean, if something is off in my body, that gets my attention so fast. Uh, many years ago, and I, many of you know this, I, I worked construction before being a pastor, and I tweaked my back at work, and I was laid up uh, literally for several weeks, three weeks or, or more, and there was a season of life where Kate and Cam were in diapers, and uh, so Jen was in this situation where I was working and gone a lot, and she's trying to do the, these guys are, uh, Kate and Cam are 15 months apart. And so, for those of you that have little kids, some of you are like, man, our kids are like three years apart, and they're really young, and it's hard. Shut up. (laughs) Oh, I want to hear it. Fifteen months apart. Like, you were really young. I know. Kate was a surprise. (laughs) And then Cam was a surprise. (laughs) And we had our two, and guess what? Like, seven years later, we had another surprise. And God bless you all, we love you. (laughs) But man, when they were 15 months apart and both in diapers, it was hard. And it was really hard when I was laid up with a bad back and I couldn't do anything. 
And, and, and so the way it works is Jen's kind of a hurricane sometimes, and she has all these projects going, she gets all this stuff going, and my job in that season of life was just to basically follow after her and try to pick up everything, right? Like, just get, try to get the house back in order. And so here I was laid up, and she was trying to manage all of this stuff, and the kids were, you know, the kids were kids. And, and every once in a while, you'd start to sense that it was too much for her, and that house was starting to get out of control, and it was stressful, and I was just laying, there's nothing I could do. I'm just like, you got this, babe. You know, your, your shirt's pretty today. And it was like this really helpless feeling. And so, you know, in that season, do you guys know what I was praying about? God, I need forgiveness. No. I'm like, God, 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 would you please, please, please heal Jen's attitude? (laughs) No, no, no. I just said, like, this week I had a big moment of awe, and it's because she's amazing. Actually, she, she carried me through. That was unbelievable. She's dealing with all the kids and bringing me ice packs, and it was, it was nuts. In that season, I was like, God, would you please fix my back? I need to get back to work. I don't know how long this is going to go on. I got to get back to work. I got to love my kids. I got to parent my kids. I got to be a partner to my wife. This is like miserable. God, would you fix my back? Would you please, please, please heal me? And in different seasons of life, we, we have all kinds of different felt needs, don't we? Some seasons, it's physical. Some, it's relational. Some, it's financial. I mean, if you, if you lose your job and you have no income, that will get your attention like that. And so you pray, right? It's like, God, I need a job. God, I need a job. I need a job. God, I need income. I need a job. God, help me. Or if an important relationship in your life goes south, maybe you have a huge fight with a very good friend or you have a blowout with one of your kids, or maybe your marriage, you realize, you just kind of look one day and you're like, this is hanging on by a thread. That stuff grabs our attention. I mean, those, those are felt needs. Like if we're single and we really don't want to be, and we've been single for a long time, we, we want to share our life, we want to we wanna find that special person, but day after day, night after night, there's just no one and we're still alone, that'll get our, that'll get our attention after a while. And so we pray. We're like, God, do something. God, if you can raise Jesus from the dead, you could get me a date. I know you could. <laughs> Bring me somebody, preferably somebody moderately attractive. Okay, you're like, I don't want to, I'm not asking too much, God. I don't need perfection. Just someone without like huge emotional issues would be so cool. And we've got all these needs these felt needs, and that stuff is in our face, and we think about it every day. Physical problems that need to be overcome, relationships that need to be repaired, income that needs to be earned. We've got bills that need to be paid. And we've got a whole list of things that we really need God to do. But you know what's not usually at the top of our list? It's forgiveness. And most of us, For most of us, forgiveness just is not a very big felt need. In fact, for many of us, forgiveness may not even be on our list at all. I mean, most of us don't wake up in the morning, right, and think first thing, man, more than anything else, I just need forgiveness. We think, I need a promotion. I need a job. I I, I need a way to pay my bills. I need this relationship to be fixed. I need my body to start working right. I need to find somebody to share my life with. But forgiveness, like for most of us, this is just not even on our radar. And that's Jesus' point, I think, with this paralyzed man. Everybody sees this man's need, and it's huge. Everybody wants to see a miracle. But I guarantee nobody was thinking as this man was being lowered down about forgiveness. In fact, Jesus tells this man that his sins are forgiven and everybody's sitting there disappointed. That's not what they came for. They want a miracle because that's exciting, that's juicy. But forgiveness? Forgiveness has a hard time making its way to the top of our list. Now, why is that? Why is that? here's what I think. 
I think it's because we don't see as Jesus sees. Jesus believed that all suffering is unnatural. Jesus believed that all suffering is ultimately the result of sin. In fact, this, this truth is so huge that it's what the first three chapters of the Bible are all about, right? And like, here's a summary of the first three chapters of the Bible. God created a beautiful world, and he put people in it. And they had an intimate, life-giving relationship with God. They walked with him. They talked with him. They had full access to him. And in a way that we can't even imagine, they were filled. They were filled by the love of God. They were also filled and made whole by loving each other. Like they were, were told in really poetic, beautiful language, they were completely authentic with one another. They hid nothing from each other. Like, can you imagine that? It was the kind of connection that we're all going around longing for. And so, like, we long for it, and then we run from it. We long for it, and then we run from it. We long for it, and then we run from it. And they had this beautiful relationship, intimate with each other, nothing hidden. And they had a beautiful relationship with creation. They always had more than enough to meet whatever their physical needs were. They lived in abundance. They never had to go without. And creation was vibrant, and it was growing, and it was changing, and it was their job to order it and to manage it. And so they worked, and they loved their work. You ever worked at something and loved what you were doing? Because it was meaningful, and it was rewarding. And they were in harmony with God, and they were in harmony with each other, and they were in harmony with creation. And there was a wholeness to them that we've never known. It was life as God intended. We can only dream of it. It's, it's what the ancient Hebrews referred to as shalom. But then, sin entered the world, and shalom was broken in every arena. No more intimate, unhindered relationship with God. People became distant from God, rebellious toward God, distrustful of God. Humanity began to be at odds with God. And humanity began to be at odds with itself. When sin came, along with it came every kind of relational breakdown. Jealousy, hatred, loneliness, insecurity, racism, abuse, war. Since the fall, even the best relationships are deeply flawed in comparison. Like even the best friendships and, and marriages are a mere shadow of what friendships and marriages are supposed to be. And we're told that even creation itself is deeply affected by sin. God placed humanity in this complex web of interactions with creation. And the reason the decision to disobey was so toxic is because it threw off the balance of everything. Of everything. The weather, the trees, the oceans, everything. And we, we sometimes ask, we're like, well, why are there earthquakes and tsunamis and hurricanes and, and droughts? Because creation itself was, was deeply affected by sin. When the door to sin opened, all kinds of suffering came flooding in. And so along with sin came every kind of disease, the breakdown of the human body. Ultimately, death came, which is unnatural. It was not supposed to be a part of the equation. See, Jesus believed that all suffering is unnatural. It's all a result of sin. Not directly, but it's all a result of sin. And that's what the first three chapters of the Bible are all about. Every facet of our world is messed up because of sin. Like, you just think about this and you go, do you know why you so often feel unappreciated or unloved? You struggle with that? Why is that? Well, here, here's why. Because you live in a messed up world. You know why it's hard to truly connect with people? Because people are messed up. So are you. You know why there's cancer and birth defects and disease? 
You know why we all struggle with all kinds of different physical problems? Because this world is fractured, it's broken, and all of it is ultimately traced back to sin, the result of sin. And here's what Jesus believed about himself. He believed that he had the authority to reverse every single effect of sin. He believed that he would eventually restore all things, that he would free humanity from every effect of sin. So here's Jesus in this moment with a man whose body is ravaged by physical disability. And Jesus knows that this is one of the many effects of sin. Not that this man is paralyzed because he sinned. Not that his paralysis is, is God like personally punishing him, but because he lives in a world that's devastated by sin, a world that's not as God intended it to be. And so Jesus essentially says, I have some good news. I can set you free from all the consequences of sin in every form. I have the authority to forgive sins. Son, your sins are forgiven. Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts, and he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. And now, this is it, right? This is the moment that everybody hoped for. So it says, he got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone. And they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. So Jesus heals this guy, and now the crowd is going nuts. Because this is the show, baby. This is what they came for, the miracles, the supernatural stuff, the good stuff. Finally, Jesus is getting to the stuff. And I wonder if in the midst of all of that celebration and all of that excitement, I wonder if Jesus was just a little bit saddened. Because maybe they were all missing the point. Jesus was trying to show them, I have the power to overcome all the consequences of sin. He's like, guys, this is only a small sample of what's coming one day in full. But when he said, son, your sins are forgiven, they all yawned and they thought, bummer. What a disappointment. Like the whole point of Jesus healing this guy was to say, look, guys, I have the authority to forgive sins, I'm telling you. And in that, I have the authority to overcome the consequences of sin. So, so when you think to yourselves, only God has the authority to forgive sins, I just want you to know, you're absolutely right. Do you see who I am? Do you see? And to show you that I truly have the ability to forgive sins and ultimately to remove their consequences, I'm going to remove one of the consequences of sin right now, right here in front of you. And Jesus heals the guy, and the crowd goes crazy. And I wonder if Jesus thought, oh, man. Oh, man, if you could only see. Guys, this is just a small part of what's to come. I, I wish you could understand that my life and my sacrifice will accomplish something extraordinary for you. If you, if you put your faith in me, Someday you will truly experience life as God intended it. There's going to be a new heaven, and there's going to be a new earth, and there will be no effects of sin. So that longing that you have to feel loved and, and, and wanted and respected and appreciated, you will fully experience that someday. It's coming. The desire you have for your body to work right, you have no idea what your redeemed body will be like. That desire that you have sometimes to just experience more of God, I can't even describe for you. 
what that's going to be like for you. In fact, all of it is just beyond description. But I wish you could get it, because if you did, you wouldn't save all of your awe for a miracle that only includes a little bit of physical healing. You'd go all out in your celebration of the truth that you can truly be forgiven, that all of the consequences of sin will one day be fully removed. Had they understood who it was that was really standing in front of them, had they understood the depth of Jesus' real authority, that he could heal more than just the physical stuff in this moment in front of them, that one day he would heal everything, maybe forgiveness would have seemed a little more exciting. Maybe everyone wouldn't have, wouldn't have yawned. But you and I are in a different place because we're on the other side of this. And so we know what Jesus would go on to do. We know what it, it all ultimately means. We know that the same hands that reached out and touched the paralyzed man, those same hands were stretched out and they were nailed to a cross. And in that moment, Jesus paid the full price for our freedom. Jesus liberated us from all of the consequences of sin. And that means everything that isn't right in our world will one day be repaired. God has not left us to suffer alone in our pain. In Jesus, God entered our world and endured the pain. He experienced the consequences of sin himself. On the cross, Jesus bore the full extent of it. And we got all these things in our lives that we want fixed, right? We want some stuff fixed. We all have stuff that we want God to do for us. But what Jesus wants us to see, what he wants us to know, is that all of our problems are mere symptoms. They're, they're symptoms of living in brokenness. And every miracle he performed demonstrated his authority over sin and its effects. Every time he dealt with a symptom of the effects of sin, whether it was leprosy or hunger or blindness or paralysis or poverty or loneliness. Every time he dealt with these symptoms, he demonstrated his authority to restore all things. We all have felt needs. We all have pressing needs. We, we have things we want Jesus to do for us. We have things that are constantly clamoring for our attention. But every once in a while, it's good to stop and remember that Jesus has already dealt with our greatest need. He's freed us from every long-term effect of sin. So this morning, it's, it's my hope that we can pause and in some way we can recapture that awe. Uh, the application of this morning's message is simply this. I'm just inviting you to pause and reflect on what Jesus has done. Because we're all walking in here with problems. And we all live in a deeply broken world. But none of that brokenness, and this is what he wants us to know, this is the hope, that none of that brokenness will have the last word. And here's why. Because your sins have been forgiven. Like no matter what you've done, if you've put your faith in Jesus, you've put your trust in Jesus, then your sins have been forgiven. And that means that all the effects of sin have been defeated. And so whatever your struggles are, whatever your pain is, whatever you're wrestling with, it's temporary. Healing is coming. Justice is coming. Wholeness is coming. This is what Jesus wants to reach through the pages of Scripture and grab us by the shirt and say, it's coming. It's coming. It's coming in all its fullness, just the way that God intended. And it's happening because our Father has refused to give up on us. Because he has made a way for each of us to come home. A while back, and I'll, I'll close with this, um, I was kind of following my, I have a, like a daily reading plan. It's called the Moravian Text. And um, many of you do this or participate in this. And um, one of the recent readings was from the book of Isaiah. And I came across a passage that really captivated me. It's, it's a messianic passage about the coming king. And it was originally spoken 
to people that were living in exile, okay, conquered people that had lost their homes and they had been enslaved to a foreign nation. People living under the authority of a brutal foreign king. And this was written 700 years before Jesus lived. 700 years. But God reaches out to these people that are hurting and confused and broken, and he says, these circumstances will not have the last word. And so I want to close this message by reading to you guys from Isaiah. And it starts with this. It says, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. So out of the stump of Jesse, which was just a metaphor for the nation of Israel, a tattered, beaten nation, a nation that had at one time been this majestic tree, out of Jesse, now this, this stump, will come a branch. And this hope in the middle of deadness is that this branch will spring up, that a king will arise, and that he will be an entirely different kind of king goes on it says the spirit of the lord will rest on him the spirit of wisdom and of understanding the spirit of counsel and of might the spirit of the knowledge and fear of the lord and he will delight in the fear of the lord and he will govern with justice and with grace it says he will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears but with righteousness he will judge the needy with justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth This king will judge fairly. This king will take up the cause of the hurting and the cause of the broken. This king will use his might and his power and his authority to defend the weak instead of oppressing them. He'll use it to heal the broken. He'll use it to bring justice to those that are not getting justice. And he will rule in a way that no king has ever ruled. This is is awesome. It says, He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. But here's the part that just arrested my imagination when I read this. Isaiah uses breathtaking imagery to describe the the kingdom of this king. What will life be like for those that are a part of his kingdom? And Isaiah describes peace. He describes shalom like we've never known. And these are the images that were just powerful to me. It says, The wolf will live with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The essence of nature, and this is the picture, the essence of nature will be changed. No more predators, no more prey. Can you imagine that? The most ferocious animals will be at peace with the most vulnerable. It says the cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together. And the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. And why will it be this way? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The whole earth will know the beauty and the love and the kindness of God. Like this is our hope. This is the heart of our king. And this is happening because your sins have been forgiven. It's happening because my sins have been forgiven. And so I just want to close with a question this morning. When's the last time you felt awe and poured out your heart in worship just over the reality that your sin is forgiven. And this morning, I I want to invite you, I want to invite us to enter into worship. Not just to sing some songs, um, but to truly engage our hearts, to think about the the meaning of, of the words that we're singing, and then to pour out those words in gratitude, and in hope. And it's my hope that this morning we would pause long enough to recognize what's true and what's, what's there all the time and just let our hearts be filled with awe.